Uh, hi, everybody. Howdy. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here at the first uh, Emacs conference. I, I was reflecting that if I'd known when I was a boy that there was going to be an Emacs conference one day, it would have certainly been my dream to come here and give a talk for all of you. So thank you, everybody, for making that happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so I'm, uh, my talk is, is uh, called How to Write a, a Fancy Emacs Space IDE Like Slime. Uh, so it's, it's not a big demo uh, like Slime. I'm not going to try and compete with John's uh, crazy Emacs Lisp uh, demo. Rather, it's to say that, okay, Slime is something uh, really uh, an interesting program that we've written, and it would be cool if there were more programs like that, and maybe uh, some people here would like to do a similar thing for another programming language. And this, this is what I can tell you about the, the backstory of the project and uh, some, some tips that might be useful if you'd like to do something similar. Uh, so before I get underway, I'd like to make a, a small uh, disclaimer that uh, Slime is the work of a tremendous, a tremendous number of people. More than 100 people have contributed code, and the real kind of godfather of the Slime community is a guy called Helmut Eller. It's not me. I'm not the largest contributor by any means. Uh, the reason I'm here is that when they asked on the mailing list, Helmut, he knows that I like flying around and talking to people. And he said, well, why don't you get Luke to go and uh, give a talk? Um, so uh, I'm, uh, I come from Australia. I've been using Hacking Emacs for maybe 15 years or something like that. Um, I lived in Sweden for a long time. I, I lived in Stockholm when I was uh, doing my slime hacking. It was a period of, of my life when I had no internet uh, connected at home. It was ferociously uh, productive. <laughs> uh, and I live in Switzerland these days. Um, so Slime, uh, for me, it's, it's actually the most fun project I, I ever worked on in, in any capacity. It was just um, so, so much activity and so, so, um, so many interesting people to work with. And so it, it has a very fond kind of uh, place in my heart in that sense. Um, as, uh, well, can we have a quick show of hands? Who actually knows what Slime is? Okay, most people. And who has actually used it? Okay, about half, say. Fantastic. Okay, because I'm not going to give any demonstration. So um, if you don't if you don't know what it is I'm talking about, you can go uh, later in Google and find some screencasts and and uh, see what it is. So Slime these days is more or less the standard development environment for at least uh, in Emacs for common Lisp programmers, of which there are a fair few out there in the world. Particularly in the open source scene, Slime is what people tend to use. Uh, it's uh, got about 150 authors credited in the changelog, roughly. Um, it's about 50,000 lines of code, which is a fair bit for like well-factored Lisp programs. And it's, it's 10 years old now. So it was 10 years ago that we really got underway, nine years since the, the 1.0 release was, going, uh, was made. And it's still very actively developed, and the mailing list has still got patches flying around and everything, but it's a very mature piece of software by now. Uh, I also, I think the reason that, that I, I hope it's interesting to talk about uh, still now after all of this time is that it's, it's an example of a pretty fancy kind of an Emacs-based development environment targeting a language that's not Emacs Lisp. So you see all the really funky stuff uh, that you have built in Emacs that we saw in John's talk uh, is, is really cool. And there's not a lot of other languages around where you can do similarly, uh, similarly advanced development from within Emacs. But Slime is one where, where people have really put in the, the effort to bring it up to the same kind of level uh, as the native Emacs Lisp support, even towards an external programming language. So uh, there's, there's a tremendous number of features that you need to do this. The history of, the history of Emacs working together with the Lisp programming is, is uh, very long. So since the 1970s or something, people have been using these together. And that means there's uh, an incredibly high um, cost of entry in terms of features just to be taken seriously. So Slime has maybe 100 features that people have had to, to implement that are kind of hardly worth mentioning. It's just that people would just throw it away and say it was crap if it didn't have each and every one of them. Um, but in addition to that, we've, we've kind of tried to go a little bit uh, above and beyond with, with a few features I'd like to highlight. Uh, one is uh, the treatment of uh, compiler error messages. So, uh, one thing that common Lisp systems are very good at is giving you a lot of uh, comments and notes about your programs, particularly if you ask them uh, to, to give you some hints about how to make them run faster. It's very common to get hundreds or thousands of lines of, uh, of output from the compiler when you compile a program or even when you compile a function. And uh, this was always a big problem for people uh, using uh, compilers like CMUCL. And one uh, really great feature in Slime is to take all of those messages and kind of light up your, your Emacs buffer like a Christmas tree, putting every message on exactly the expression in the source file uh, that it applies to, so that you actually have enough context to, to make sense of them, which solved a problem that, that a lot of people related to. Uh, another feature that I'd like to highlight that uh, that's pretty fancy is, is one called presentations. Uh, this comes out of somebody's PhD thesis from MIT in the 80s, and it was popular on the Lisp machines. So that is where 
every time, every time you evaluate some Lisp code and you print a result, uh, the result is it's not just a string. Uh, so it's converted to a string so that you can print it in an Emacs buffer, like the read eval print loop. But it also has a, is tagged with a text property that is effectively a back pointer to the object in the running system with some type information so that Emacs knows what it is. So for example, when you define a function, you see the function name uh, appear in the read eval print loop, you can right click on that and Emacs knows that it's a, a common list function and gives you a little context menu. And you can say, for example, show me uh, every place where this function is called or disassemble this function for me and show me you know, what, what the compiler has done with it. Um, and another, another which I particularly liked and, and invested a lot of time in is getting the, the debugger to to really have a lot of debug information around the place. So for instance, if you get an error in a program that you've developed in a very ad hoc way, you've compiled some things from files, you've compiled other bits uh, in, in source files that you never saved, you've compiled other bits, uh, yet other sort of scratch buffers and that kind of thing, uh, the debugger can actually find all of those. So you can be walking through a backtrace and it's actually pulling up these crazy little scratch buffers that you forgot you had because it knows that that's where the, the code is. Uh, so what, what I think is interesting about um, it's just the fact that, that a lot of people went to the, to the effort to get a lot of features working on that kind of level. Um, so that's why Slime is, is interesting. And then I hope you'll also be interested to know how we kind of made it happen, um, what, what the development process was, because it was, it was a tremendous amount of fun. And it started about 10 years ago in what, with hindsight, I think was an absolutely masterful bit of um, social engineering by a Frenchman called Eric Marsden. So he wrote a very short-lived predecessor to Slime called Slim, which was, uh, it was a, a similar kind of thing. It was an Emacs mode for, for programming in common list with CMUCL, and it only had basically two features. It was a very, very small program, more of a demo than a, a real something you could use. Um, it had the feature with the compiler nodes, which was a great demo that everybody wanted, and also notably uh, the communication between Emacs and Lisp process was through sockets uh, in a very robust way as opposed to screen scraping uh, the, the prompt, which had been a uh, pain in everybody's sides. Um, so he, he, did, he gave it these two fantastic features, and the other thing that he did was he published it on the internet, on, on the Emacs channel, and just said, I will never touch this code again uh, as long as I live. This is, this is abandoned where um, I'm working on my PhD thesis. This is just a, a procrastination vehicle. Um, and it was great. So he showed us collectively that, that, uh, that we could have it so much better. We could have it so extremely much better, but there was a tremendous amount of work to do, and his he was going to do it, so we would have to do it uh, ourselves. Um, so he created a very important problem. And I was the one who, who bid on that first. I took his code and, uh, and started kind of hacking away at it and, and rewriting it as is kind of my process for understanding things. Uh, in the process, uh, historically renaming his source files, which was uh, slim.el for the front end and skank.lisp for the back end after the Fat Boy Slim song he was listening to at the time, the Rockefeller skank. And uh, in my copy, I called them slime.el and, uh, and swank.lisp to avoid uh, naming conflicts. And that, that is kind of why it has those strange names. Um, and I hacked away on that and, and did some rewrites and stuff uh, for maybe a week or so. And then uh, thought I had brought it to a good place and, and wanted some more expressions of interest. And I posted on the CMUCL development list. Uh, and in one of these great fateful moments, uh, Helmut Eller was, was reading there. And he said, well, that looks cool. Uh, you know, why, why don't I join in and we, we do this together? So then uh, the rest was just uh, like a snowball uh, gathering steam and, and really um, driving along. So we created a SourceForge project uh, with a CVS repository, as one did in those days. <laughs> and we, and um, yeah, and we, and we started hacking it out in the open. And, and then over the, the next year or so, uh, we kind of hacked at a ferocious pace. And there were a lot of people. It just struck a chord with lots of people. Everybody wanted this. Uh, everybody, um, all the really early adopters in the CMUCO, CMUCL world started using it and sending in patches and feedback. And then people using other lists started sending in patches, which we would reject because we didn't want to support any other lists. But then the patches got so good that we wanted the features and we wanted them to work on it. So we started taking them in and, and so on. And, and it just uh, grew. And after about a year, um, we had probably about 50 people having contributed, and it, was, it, felt, it felt good uh, to, to kind of call it a version 1.0 and, and release it into the world. Uh, and that's actually the point that I kind of moved on from the project and, and uh, did other things that I've been doing ever since, but the project as a whole uh, continued on, and Helmut is the steady hand uh, keeping everything uh, under control uh, all this time. So I think that was a, a just an amazingly fun experience, and I, I think I can recommend it um, to other people if you'd like to do something similar. Actually, so I think there's a lot of there's a lot of programming language communities around that have like pretty good programming languages that have been around for a long time, 
And there's a lot of people using Emacs uh, every day without particularly much extension, maybe without any live interaction with a, a running program. And these can be really impressive people. You can have you know, programming languages with these godlike figures who have designed the language and written the compiler and all of these kind of things. And they can be using really primitive uh, Emacs uh, support uh, decade after decade. And as a kind of an incoming newbie uh, who has some, some Emacs Lisp skills, which are pretty unusual in the world, actually, you can get great leverage over these to do something immensely valuable for all of these people who, who are maybe actually very godlike uh, and intimidating, but you, when you fix their Emacs configuration, they're going to be so thankful, they're going to be so happy. And people, you know, it's just a, it's just a great uh, dynamic. So uh, if you're working with a programming language that doesn't have very good Emacs support, uh, it's something that you could think about doing. And if, uh, if you would like to take the plunge, I, I then thought of just a few of the technical tips that I think um, are worth sharing from the Slime experience, and it would be a bit of a pity to, um, to charge ahead without knowing. So um, first of all, really basic, probably uh, extreme common sense these days, is that the days of screen scraping uh, prompts are over. Uh, it's, it's just painful and it's flaky if you want to do advancing. So use something like a socket. Uh, something something robust uh, for communication between an Emacs front end and and a, another system that you're controlling. Uh, another thing uh, on the protocol level is that we started off with a very synchronous request response design and then moved extremely far from that uh, towards the asynchronous design, which was which uh, was fantastic in terms of getting robustness. So so in the beginning we had a socket and. Every time you would run a command, like you would want to, uh, you want to compile a function, so you would run the compile command, and Emacs would take the text, send it off to Lisp, and then kind of block the whole world until the response came back, uh, which is painful, uh, especially if it takes a long time to compile, or if you're running over a laggy connection or something like that. So the next step that we took was obviously just to send the request and let you edit until the reply came, but it was quite a quite a bit more refinements that were really worth doing. So the next really important thing was to make Emacs not really care if the response came at all, and also if it would send a lot of requests in parallel to not particularly care about the order in which uh, the results would come back. So this turned out to be just absolutely crucial in terms of dealing with a, a really kind of funky, multi-threaded Lisp that's doing signal handling, that's entering the debugger recursively, and all of these kind of things. It was a lot of kind of banging our heads and, and getting these strange uh, synchronization errors until we just took all of the state out of Emacs and just made it as, uh, as lightweight as possible. And uh, the, the third thing that is kind of controversial, and a lot of people were really pissed off about this in Slime, but I think it was fantastic, uh, was that we, we, never made, uh, we never made releases. So if you wanted to use Slime, you had to check it out uh, from the repository um, directly off the, off the bleeding edge. And the reason for this was to create a, a, a really tight positive feedback loop with all of our users. So we knew in the beginning that there was going to be lots and lots and lots of problems. There are these small features that people have been using uh, in, in predecessors to Slime all of their lives, and they're going to freak out when they see that they're not there, and they're going to be screaming about it all over the internet. Or they're going to be using a funny version of Emacs or XEMacs or have some customization, and it's just going to you know, fall over when they try to load things. And what we wanted was that every time someone has one of these problems, the time it takes for us to fix this and get the change into their hands and make them happy and make them say nice things and encourage us, we just wanted that to be going really, really fast. And the way to do that was to make sure everybody has a working checkout, so it's just one command for them to take a change after you've pushed it, and then actually to troll the internet, troll all of these like horrible Usenet groups and just see all the horrific things people are saying about your program and, and just kind of fix them in the background and, and hope that the comments start becoming more, more positive over time, which I think that they, um, they inevitably do. And uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? If we have time. Hi, I read that you're doing some interesting stuff with Lua these days. Are you still using Emacs? So I'm, I am using Emacs. I'm going to do Eric Marsden here. I can say that, that in the Lua world, I'm extremely disappointed uh, with, the, with the Emacs support, but I'm damned if I'm going to write another like a year's worth of uh, Emacs hacking. So if anybody here would like to do uh, like a, a small slime for Lua, you would be my hero. Um, <laughs> I don't know. So it's interesting. So the question was, don't you just write a swank backend for Lua and get on with it? So I don't know. 
So when I, when I was working on Slime, I was using very specifically CMUCL. There's one implementation of Lisp, and I was putting a lot of uh, energy into getting all of the details just so. And so from my perspective, the further you got from CMUCL, uh, the, the, just the worse the experience got. Uh, so even going to SPCL for me was very painful because I, there were all of these individual things that I had just fixed and they were just so, and then you go to the, a very close cousin in list terms and suddenly it's like, you know, nothing works. Uh, one of the reasons I didn't uh, want to do a demo of Slime today is that a lot of the things that I remember working so well uh, didn't, didn't do what I expected them to, which is, and, and my feeling is that this gets worse and worse as you go further. So I'm a bit, I'm a bit, um, I was a bit sad to see when the Clojure community picked up Slime, for example. So the Clojure community growing massively, doing very, very exciting things, but, but Slime is designed to solve the problem of common list Emacs integration. So it's, it's sad for me, the idea, that you're gonna get these thousands and thousands of people picking it up, trying it for something it wasn't designed for, hitting a lot of you know, bad cases because it's just not what it's supposed to do and just thinking, wow, that sucks. So um, I, I really like what they're doing with, uh, with the NREPL, and I would like to see someone do something similar for, for Lua and other languages that are outside the commonlist family. I think it's worth investing the time in building something up. Although you remind me, I would love to plug one uh, fantastically fancy uh, Swank backend by Christoph uh, over there. So if you, if you happen to use the R, uh, statistical programming language, he has an Emacs mode for you, and you should go and tap him on the shoulder and ask for an extremely nice demo. Any questions? Any further questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.